He goes by T Rev, so we'll call him that as well. And he joins us now. Thank you very much uh, for coming with your uh, splendid YOLO hat on. You only live once. I count my blessings for the days when I was down and losing faith. They made me patient. All I can say is thank you. I really wouldn't be the same if I ain't gone through all the pain. Look what it made me. All I can say is thank you. What is going on, Rev Gang family? We are back and we are going to do another deep dive here. And we're going to just touch up on some of the interviews and places that Ethan. Maddie, Kaylee, and Xana were during the time of the murders. Now, if you're here and you checked out the last video, the timeline video that I dropped, make sure you go check it out. It has a lot of facts to it because it is the timeline that was given to us by the police. I appreciate everybody, all the new subscribers. If you're new to the channel, make sure you smash that subscribe button. Make sure you turn on your notification bell for all true crime. Now, with that being said, let's go ahead and take this walk and take a little deep dive into some of the interviews, the pressers, and known surrounding facts to the case. My name is Chief James Fry with the Moscow Police Department. I'm gonna be reading from my notes today because I want the information you receive to be extremely accurate. We know you have questions, and so do we. That is why we're here. Joining me today is the Latah County Prosecutor, Bill Thompson, University of Idaho President, Scott Green, Provost and Vice President, Tori Lawrence, University of Idaho Dean of Students, Blaine Eccles, Latah County Sheriff, Richie Skiles, Chief Deputy of Latah County, Tim Best, Idaho State Police Colonel, Kedrick Wills. This was a horrible crime that took the lives of Ethan Chapin, Zanna Kernodal, Madison Mogan, and Clay Kaylee Goncalves. Now, this is the start of the presser, and you can immediately hear he got a couple names wrong he had Kernodal right i think he got ethan chapin wrong and then kaylee gone calves is how he said it and a lot of us had it wrong coming out but to be on the police force and to get that wrong i think that hit home with the family to me i think it was disrespectful to them and maybe that's how they took it at the time because they were grieving but i know they're appreciative of the good law enforcement work that was done here now let's get back to looking at this first presser and analyzing it this horrible crime has affected all of us the families the university of idaho our community our country he's right it did affect our country and let's take one second in this video to pray for the families and the victims amen and our officers agencies that are involved in this task force include Latah county sheriff's office the idaho state police and the federal bureau of investigations as we continue our investigation we have learned that ethan and Zana were at a party on campus now i kind of want to jump into the story of that night for Zana and ethan because there's a lot of confusion surrounding it and i would just like to cover the facts to it on the night of november 12th kernodal and chapin had gone to a fraternity party at the sigma chi from 8 p.m to 9 p.m on the university City of Idaho campus. The young couple then arrived back at home on King Road that Kernodal, Mogan, and Gonsalves shared with two other female students around 1.45 a.m. on the 13th of November. The two locations are only minutes apart on foot and based in busy student areas close to Greek Road where the Idaho University students and sorority and fraternity houses sit. Now I do want to cover this topic here because it is heavily talked about within the true crime community. Xana Kernodal and Ethan Chapin were found dead by his best friend who checked for their pulse before calling 911 from a surviving roommate's cell phone eight hours later. The unidentified friend had gone over to the Moscow, Idaho home on the morning of November 13th, hours after Chapin and Kernodal, both 20, Maddie Mogan, 21, and Kaylee Gonsalves, 20, were slain in their sleep by suspected killer Brian Kohlberg. Sources told news outlets Chapin's best friend found the two bodies and took their pulse before shouting at roommate Dylan Mortensen 21 and others to call 911 around 11:58 a.m. What the real story is, I don't know, but I think we're going to have to wait till trial to find out. So let's continue back 
on the presser and keep diving in. And Madison and Kaylee were at a downtown bar. They arrived home sometime after 1.45. So Madison, Mogan, and Kaylee Gonsalves had gone to the corner club that night at downtown sports bar at about 10 p.m., from which they departed at, at 1.30 a.m. A live stream video on Twitch by the Grub Truck, a food truck four blocks south at Friendship Square, Main and 4th Streets, showed Mogan and Gonsalves at 1.41 a.m. chatting and smiling, getting their food 10 minutes later, and leaving to take what the police initially said was an Uber ride home. A trip about a one mile. The police later rephrased their statement to say the ride was provided by a private party arriving home at 1.56 a.m. Now we touched on this in the timeline last night when I dropped the documentary. Now I do want to bring up an important detail. The Gonsalves family sat down with Chronicles of Olivia and put out an interesting statement. Now what caught my eye that was in this interview that Chronicles of Olivia did with the Gonsalves family was Christy said she saw them get home at 156 and that the grub truck footage solidified the timeline for her when it came to Madison Mogan and Kaylee Gonsalves. So I do want to make that point to everybody. If you haven't went and watched that interview, go watch it. She says she's seen the girls arrive home on Ring video. I thought that was interesting and you might too, but let's dive back in. If anyone in our community or across our nation has any information about these times or the victim's whereabouts, please call our tip line at 208-883-7180. The facts of the case that we know right now. We know that these homicides occurred in the early morning hours of Sunday, November 13th. Around noon, Moscow officers received a call of an unconscious person. Officers discovered the bodies of Ethan Chapin, Zana Kernodal, Madison Mogan, and Kaylee on calves inside the residence on King Road. Four were stabbed with a knife, but no weapon has been located at this time. There was no sign of forced entry into the residence. Investigators are continuing to collect evidence at the scene. Investigators are working to develop a timeline to relevant events. Autopsies are taking place today on all the victims so we can continue to gather evidence and solve the crime. Investigators are working to follow up on all leads and to identify identify a person of interest. Based on details at the scene, we believe this was an isolated, targeted attack on our victims. We do not have a suspect at this time, and that individual is still out there. We cannot say that there's no threat to the community. At this point in the presser, they said that there was a threat to the community, but they would later change that statement, and I always wondered why. Let's keep going. And as we have stated, please stay vigilant, report any suspicious activity, and be aware of your surroundings at all times. What we do know, or what we don't know, excuse me. The identity and location of the suspect. The location of the knife or any clothing that was worn by the suspect. Currently, we have 25 plus investigators working this case, as well as assistance from the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the Idaho State Police. We're reviewing video that has been collected, but we are asking citizens to contact us with any information you may have that will help in this investigation. So here's a little background on Moscow Police Chief James Fry. He is considered a quiet, modest man. Typically, he only has a microphone in his face at city council meetings. But the slaying of four University of Idaho students on November 13th thrust the 53-year-old face of the Moscow Police Department into the national spotlight. He does not want to be the guy who's front and center, Moscow Mayor Art Bedge said. He doesn't want the limelight. What he wants is just results and he works to provide provide other people with the resources that they need to achieve those ends. Fry provided updates on the case at news conferences packed with national and local media and watched across the country. He and his apartment of 30 sworn officers faced criticism by some who said Fry did not provide enough information and that his department was not equipped to handle a quadruple homicide investigation. Bedge said he could tell Fry did not like speaking at the press conference or two. It wasn't his natural niche he said. He grew into the position and did much better with each passing press conference. Latah County Prosecuting Attorney Bill Thompson said Fry presents himself as he is, very straightforward and candid. Fry said in an interview last week he was unable to answer questions related to the investigation because of the gag order issued by Latah County Magistrate Judge Megan Marshall. The order prohibits police and attorneys from providing information on the case. He was however able to dive into his service 
background. Fry, who has a wife of 32 years and four grown children, started at the department as a reserve officer in 1994. He rose through the ranks and became chief in 2016. He has deep roots in Moscow, in our community, in our university, and that definitely shows in his care and consideration when leading the Moscow police, UI spokeswoman Jody Walker said. Walker said the university has a long history of collaboration with Fry and the police department, and that provided a great foundation foundation on which to work when the four students were killed November 13th. He cares deeply, he's very professional, Walker said. In 30 plus years, the Moscow police Fry has worked a handful of homicide cases. He said those cases gave him experience and knowledge that helped with the U of I student killings. That included knowing when to reach out to Idaho State Police and the FBI for assistance. In the UI stabbings, the work of the Moscow Police, State Police, FBI, and other agencies led to December 30th arrest of Brian Christopher Kohlberger, a 28-year-old Washington State University graduate student. The arrest in Pennsylvania came seven weeks after Madison Mogan, Kaylee Gonzalez, Xander Kernodal, and Ethan Chapin were stabbed to death at the woman's rental home just off of the U of I campus. Fry got a rare taste of the FBI in 2019 when he graduated from a 10-week training course at the FBI National Academy in Quantico, Virginia. Fry told Moscow Pullman Daily News in 2019 the opportunity is presented to 1% of law enforcement personnel in the U.S. He took 17 graduate level credits at the course. The classes included leadership, contemporary issues in law enforcement, and behavioral analysts, Fry told Daily News. Badge said Fry brought those skills to the U of I student homicides investigation. He said Fry's nearly three decades at the department also helped. Being here and starting as a patrol guy and working his way up, he achieved foot on the ground experience and then gradually garnered administrative experience as he grown up through the ranks to be chief, Betch said. So he knows it all from top to bottom. Fry described himself as a servant leader. I believe that we need to take care of the people that we have working for us to go out and perform the duties, Fry said. He said he tries to lead his officers by example. There's nothing that I would ask our officers to do that I wouldn't go do, he said. As an example, less than a month ago after he graduated from the FBI course, Fry directed traffic in knee-deep water during a Moscow flood. So there we go, there's just a little background on Chief James Fry and who he is to Moscow, Idaho. So let's dive back into where we were at. But this time, um, I'm going to open it up to some questions that I'm sure you have, and we'll do the best we can to uh, answer those for you. I'm Amanda Rowley with Crem2 News. Uh, you mentioned that there's uh, an indication that it's an isolated, targeted incident, and there is an individual somewhere. Can you give us a reason as to why there's that belief there is a suspect? And can you also uh, give a little more information on the force entry? There's no sign of force entry, but was the door, did it seem like any of the entries were left unlocked by any means? We're not 100% sure if the door was unlocked, but there was no damage to anything and the door was still open um, when we got there. I could add one more question. Um, you asked for videos to, or anything from the community to help put together that timeline. Uh, we obtained a copy of Twitch video and family members of the Gonsalves family were able to identify uh, Maddie and Kaylee in those videos at a food truck ordering food. Is the police department, our investigators, aware of that video and, and has it helped put together that timeline? We are aware of that video and it has helped. It gives us um, a time and space where uh, we know that um, two of our victims were and that helps us a ton and we'll continue to follow up all leads that we can and um, continue to gather those. Any indication of a party at the home that night? Not that we know of, not at the home. We know that um, Zaina and Ethan were at a different party on campus. Chief Wright, John Webb with KHQ. Um, on September 12th, uh, there was a vandal alert that was sent out about a potential stabbing threat on Paradise Path. Does this have any connection with what we've seen so far? Not that we know of it, but we're following up every lead. Every piece of information we get, we are following up to ensure nothing has gone unturned. We want to have the individual identified 
um, who is the suspect of this eventually. Um, so we are literally looking into every aspect of everything. You guys have said repeatedly that there's no threat to the public, but we don't know who the suspect is. We don't know where he's at. How is there no threat to the public at this point? Well, that's kind of an unknown. Like I said, we took the information that we had at the time, um, but we do need to be aware. The individual is still out there, right? Uh, we need to be vigilant. We need to uh, watch out for our neighbors. We're a community policing um, community. We've said that um, for years, and it's the community that watches out for each other. We need to continue to do that until we can um, close this off and make an arrest. Why has there been such limited information over the past couple of days? I mean, we're almost four days into this. Why has it been so limited? Yeah, it's a difficult, um, we have a lot of information coming in. We have um, tried to push out some information through press releases, but the reality is I probably should have been standing here a day or so ago, but I'm here now. We're going to continue to be here. We're going to continue to give you the information we can. Um, we care about this community. I care about this community. I've worked here for 27 years. I want this community to be the safest community around. So the mayor has called it a crime of passion. Is there any indication that that's true? Now the mayor had came out and said it looks like a crime of passion, but where would the mayor get that information? See, that's what makes me think that they had some type of information to know that this was a crime of passion. How? Maybe something being left behind. Was there items taken? What was it? Now I'm just throwing this out there. I'm totally speculating. Do not count this to be a fact, but it really does aim at information being and known early on in the case. Let's jump back in. Um, we're looking into every aspect of this. We're going to continue to investigate until evidence will get that. So, okay. one last else? question, if I could, Chief. Um, have, have we looked at any boyfriends or any ex boyfriends, any spouses? as a potential suspect? I will tell you, we are looking at everyone. We are every tip we get, every lead we get. There's no one that we're not gonna talk to. There's no one we're not gonna interview. There's no one that we're not gonna look into. Um, and we're gonna do our due diligence. We're going to make sure that uh, nothing goes unturned and that we um, do everything we can with the assistance of all the resources we have to uh, get a final answer. Okay, thanks, Chief Ryan. So there were, oh, sorry, I'm Emma Epperly with this folks Hi. interview. Hi. Um, so there were other uh, roommates who lived at that uh, that residence. Um, were the roommates home at the time of the attack? There was other people home at that time, but we are not just focusing just on them. We're focusing on everybody that um, may be coming and going from that residence. So since they were home, was it a hostage situation? No, it was not. Um, and then did they didn't call it into police, so were they um, injured? They were not injured, um, but like I said, we're still following up with everybody that um, could have been in that area. And how can you say it's a uh, targeted attack if um, you don't have a suspect? Like I said, we take the totality of the situation, we try to make the best bit of information we can with everything that comes in, and then we make our decision off of that. So at this time, I'm not gonna expand upon that, um, but like I've said, we do have a suspect out somewhere, and we are looking for that individual to uh, solve this. Hi, uh, Rachel Sun, Northwest Public Broadcasting. I just want to clarify something you said earlier over the past couple of days, the information that we've been getting is there is not a threat to the public. And earlier I heard you say, you can't be sure that there is no threat. I just want to clarify what um, your stance is on that. So we, we did believe, we still believe it's a targeted attack. So the very logical thought here to me when thinking and going back and listening to this presser is that by November 16th, they knew that this was a targeted attack. Now, there would be signs at the murder scene that would prove it would be a targeted attack. What they knew, I can't explain. We still have zero answers from the coroner. We still have a lot of unknown information that we don't know about, but we do know one thing this was targeted there's still a, a person out there who committed four horrible horrible crimes so i think we got to go back to there is a, a threat out there still possibly we don't know we don't believe it's going to be to anybody else i know you said when the call came in it was for an unconscious per person and also that was a stabbing it seems just from an outside perspective looking in like that would be um not the first thing a, a person calling in would think. You're right. Um, but the report that we got was that it was an unconscious individual. It wasn't until our officers arrived on scene, went in to do um, caregiving check on the individual who was unconscious that we um, found the scene that we found. Hi, Heather Roberts with ABC News. Just to follow up on what she asked, so the other two roommates were there at the time of the attack? 
All the information that we have from our investigation is that, yes, they were. Okay, but they were unhurt. That is correct. So is there any explanation as to why it took so long then for someone to call 911? You have surviving witnesses to an incident at 3 or 4 in the morning, and the 911 call didn't come until noon? I don't think I ever said that they were witnesses. I said they were there. Um, so, you know, we don't know why that call came in at noon and not um, in the middle of the night. Um, what if we love for that to have happened? Yes, but that, that's not how it took place. So um, we're, that's why we're investigating everything still to try to pull all the pieces together. Were they one of the people, were, were they the 911 caller? Um, at this point in time, I'm not going to divulge who our 911 caller is um, just because I want to keep the um, integrity of the investigation at this point, okay? Okay. And last question, are you able to tell whether the same weapon was used on all four victims? You know, that's why we're having the autopsies done. The autopsy will confirm that and hopefully collect um, some evidence for us, um, even from, from those. That's why you do um, the autopsies is to try to be thorough and try to gather more. So um, we'll leave that. That, that. that would probably be something that would come out later. I mean, Derek showed Fox News, Fox News Digital. Uh, was there anything missing in the home or were the purses still there? Any robbery attempt, anything like that? Nothing that uh, we have identified. And I'm going to take about two more questions, all right? Hi, I'm Tim with the uh, Daily Evergreen. I was just wondering, um, were the two other individuals present at the home when police responded at noon? Yes. Uh, Chief, if you don't mind elaborating a bit more on those those two people. Well, was it two people? Um, what have those people shared about the circumstances of that night, what they saw or didn't see? I'm not going to um, go into what they shared that night. Obviously, that's part of our investigation. That's part of the information that we're trying to um, build our complete story with. So as far as that goes, we're not going to go any further into what they know and what they don't know. How, how, many, were, how many were there? Um, we believe two. Chief, have you looked into the Victims, and do you? Uh, we understand that one may have had uh, an account linked to um, her uh, Instagram account. Uh, have you looked into those accounts? Have you seen any sort of threats made to any of the individuals? So we are looking at all um, resources. You know, we got, the, like I said, the Federal Bureau of Investigation helping us. We got our detectives, our forensic detectives, looking into that. We're trying to pull this whole picture. We're looking at everything that we can look at, social media, et cetera. Um, so to answer your question, yes, we are. Were the victims all found in one part of the house? I'm not going to divulge that either. That's part of our investigation. Okay, so now we are going to jump into the next presser where they talk about their resources and everything that they're providing to the case to solve and get to the suspect that they eventually got to, Brian Christopher Koberger. Now, they had plenty of resources, behavioral analysts, the FBI, and a bunch of different teams helping them out in this case. So make sure you listen carefully to the details that are about to be shared now. We continue to dedicate all the resources to this investigation. We've had 646 tips received, and all will be processed, vetted, investigated, and cleared. We've done over 90 interviews in this case so far, and the Moscow Police Department is utilizing the assistance from the Idaho State Police, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and the Latak County Sheriff's Office. The personnel that has been assigned to this from the Moscow Police Department is four detectives, 24 officers, and five support staff. Federal Bureau of Investigators. We have 22 investigators in Moscow. 20 additional are assigned and located in the Treasure Valley, Salt Lake City, Utah, and West Virginia. We have two behavior analysis individuals from the Federal Bureau of Investigation. For the Idaho State Police, we have 20 investigators a public information officer, ISP forensic services, and crime scene in a crime scene team. We have 15 uniformed troopers to assist our community to help uh, provide the additional resources um, for our patrols. Detectives are looking to develop any context um, content that would um, help us in this event. Anyone who has observed any not notable behavior or has any video surveillance or can provide relevant information about these murders, please call our tip line at 208-883-7180. Uh, I just want to first state that this tragic murder has shaken the community. It's been very hard for members of the community, and it's been equally difficult for our officers 
and for the investigators. We will continue to put all of our resources towards investigating and bringing this to a resolution. Okay, so here he is about to go over the night of the events where everybody was, including the two roommates that everybody talks about all the time. I've had questions about the eight hour gap. You probably had questions about the eight hour gap. Now, we're gonna let the law enforcement officer explain it himself. Here's what we've determined so far. On the evening of November 12th, Kaylee Gonzalez and Madison Morgan were at a local bar and were later at a food truck in downtown Moscow. They arrived home at approximately 1.45 a.m. on the morning of November 13th. Ethan Chapin and Zana Kernodal were at the Sigma Chi house before also arriving home at approximately 1.45 a.m. Two surviving roommates were also out in the community and they returned home at approximately 1 a.m. and did not wake up until later that morning. On the morning of November 13th, 11.58 a.m., a 911 call was placed to the Whitcomb Dispatch Center reporting an unconscious person. The call originated from inside the residence and was made from the phone of one of the surviving roommates. Reminder, earlier I was talking about one of the victim's friends going in and checking the pulse of Ethan and Santa. Now that was reported to multiple news outlets and was all over on social media on a whole bunch of different articles. I still don't know that to be a fact, but it lines up with what he said. The 911 call was made from one of the roommate's phones. Moscow Police Department officers responded and located four victims, two on the second floor and two on the third floor. The Latah County Coroner has conducted autopsies and detectives have been provided with the results of those autopsies. We know that the autopsies confirmed the identity of the four victims, determined the cause and manner of death as a homicide by stabbing, and determined that it was likely all four victims were asleep during the attack. Some of the victims had defensive wounds. There is one of the most important statements right there. Some of the victims had defensive wounds. Now, that goes with investigation skills 101. What do they do when they go to a crime scene, especially a murder crime scene? They bag the victim's hands. So defensive wounds is a sign of fighting back, protecting yourself, did they grab Brian Kohlberger, if he is the guy, allegedly, or whatever, whoever it is, the suspect, did they grab him? Is their DNA under their fingernails? Were they able to reach that? That is an important clue and something that I wanted to point out to everybody, not to say that you wouldn't find it, but it's very important that we make note of that. And each victim was stabbed multiple times. There was no sign of sexual assault. Investigators have determined the two areas of interest within the city and have provided maps which are on our Facebook page and on our website. And these are areas that they have canvassed for additional surveillance video and tips and have contacted several residents in the areas. The areas are generally south of Taylor Avenue to Palouse River Drive and west of Highway 95. Detectives have also canvassed several other neighborhoods looking for evidence, looking for additional surveillance video, and contacting residents and speaking to them to see if they may have heard or seen something. I want to address several areas of speculation, conjecture, and uh, misinformation that has circulated on uh, social media platforms and otherwise. We do not believe the following individuals are involved in this crime. The two surviving roommates, a male seen at the grub truck food vendor downtown, specifically wearing a white hoodie, a private party who provided rides home to Kaylee and Madison in the early morning hour of November 13th. Additionally, the identity of the 911 caller and the 911 call 
have not been released. So any information out there is speculation about that. So now that we have deep dove through two of the pressers, now I wanna kind of talk about this Banfield footage because I remember when the Banfield body cam first came out, there was a lot of rumors. People said they heard screams. There was four people that walked by in the background and that these kids were suspicious. Vehicles driving by at the time that this stop was conducted with the beer and people seeing this vehicle drive by. I just I remember all the phone calls that we got because we were live most of the time and you can go back and check those lives out we were live for eight to ten hours a day taking phone calls but back to the specific footage you know some people have made speculations that you could see the murders on these kids phones and a lot of different speculations when it comes to this Banfield body cam at 3 12 a.m let's note that on the Linda Lane footage that just came out you can hear what seems to be like some screech at 3 12 on the same Linda Lane footage so you can match it up on the body cam and you can also hear it on the Linda Lane footage from 3 a.m. to 4 a.m. I just want to make a note of that and let you guys know so you're aware. Now I want to go over something else. This has to do with the Gonsalves family when they sat down with Brian Enton on News Nation. They had an interview where the whole family was sitting down and they were all speaking about just the case and what was going on and the problems. Now Steve specifically said here, I don't know what would prevent you from sharing someone's alibi, something along that context. Now who we was talking about or who they were talking about, I'm not sure it even matters no more. But I'm just pointing out different things along this documentary that, you know, puzzled us during the investigation and still puzzles some people now. Um, you don't have to give a name, but I mean, is it is it someone that she knew or? I have something to say about that. Uh, I just feel like there's been a couple individuals that were cleared very fast. That may not, maybe he should not have been. And yeah. Share the strong alibi. Just really fast. Share the strong alibi. Just really fast. Share the strong alibi. Just really fast. It, just if you can like, dismiss. You know, an hour later and we're like, what? And I don't know. I don't know anything about those individuals. I just know right. they were people that, you know, definitely should have been looked at and yeah. I don't know what would prevent you from sharing somebody's alibi. Okay, so I have one more thing I want to share with you guys before we get out of here on this small deep dive documentary. I was able to find a clip of the coroner from the Idaho murders. Now, this is what she said here. Kathy, um, with a C, Mabbitt, M-A-B-B-U-T-T. -T. And I'm going to ask you, how, how long have you been doing this for? Um, I've been doing it for 16 years, I, and I just got reelected for another four. When did you get the call on Sunday? I got the call just a few minutes after noon that there were four homicides, but I didn't go to the scene um, because of law enforcement doing their investigation first, so I didn't actually go to the scene until about 5 or 5.30. Can you walk us through, like, for our viewers, kind of the process between, like, between between when police show up and then you guys getting the bodies and doing your examinations? Sure. Um, well, law enforcement goes through and um, looks for any evidence, um, takes videos and pictures of everything in there, and um, they'll start talking with people. So I don't really need to be there for that. I just, they can't move the bodies. I mean, the bodies have to stay um, as they were until the coroner gets there. So that's, those are really what, that's what my job is, to and look at the as bodies. As a coroner, do you guys do um, the autopsies and all that? No, we, um, s some do if they're an actual medical examiner, but we have forensic pathologists and we contract with Spokane to do that. So in your experience, what is it that you saw when you showed up? Um, well, there was a lot of blood. It was, yeah. It... Um, you're really all four deaths, homicides? Yes. Um, I believe that the press release was that they were from a um, sharp object, mm -hmm. so. So stabbings. Yeah, I will know more after the autopsies tomorrow. And do you believe this could be a, uh, a murder suicide or? A no, there are four homicides. Four homicides. Okay. Um, and when it comes to doing the investigation post autopsy that falls on you correct yes 
It's my job to determine the manner and mechanism of death. Um, and then I know with toxicology results, there can often be, at least in Washington, a delay. So do you have any idea how long it could take if those were relevant to get any type of results back on that? Well, the toxicology reports, right, they usually take four to six weeks, sometimes longer. Um, but I, they might, um, I don't think they're going to be relevant in the actual manner or cause of death. And do we know how long between the time of death and when police found them, approximately? No, I don't. I don't know for sure. Do we, like, do we have, like, any, like, could it have been hours? Could it have been a day? Was it maybe close? Like, is there any sort of, like, time frame there? Um, not that... Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Gotcha. Um, you said the scene was really difficult. I mean, is this something you've had to deal with before in Moscow? Um, since I've been coroner, there have been um, at least two other multiple homicide scenes that I've been involved in. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. Would you say this is probably the most gruesome? No, it's it's hard to just single it out. It's the only one I've been to where there have been four people at one scene. There have been other, the other ones have had multiple scenes. Um, and was anybody else injured, like any novices people? Uh, not that I'm aware of, but I wouldn't necessarily be notified either. Okay. I didn't know if that was like, because the injuries could be similar and they matter to you. Oh, but right. No. Were the deceased all in close proximity to each other, or were they in different rooms? Um, I don't know that I can discuss that. I think, yeah. Um, will we be able to get a copy of your report once it's concluded? I'm sure it'll be Oh, ready. sure. Yeah. Yes. Okay, just call. Yes. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Do you know yeah. what the time frame for that will be? Um, it just depends on how relevant the toxicology report is, but... Oh, okay. okay. So, so it, could, it was like the four to six weeks. So it okay. could be. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank yeah. You. Thank you. We appreciate it. Sure. The coroner is still processing the gruesome murder scene. It was very, very traumatic. Yeah. Have you seen anything like that before? No. Wow. So she seemed pretty touched by this tragedy, and you could tell that she was visibly shaken, nervous, etc. Thank you guys for tuning into this deep dive documentary with me on the pressers and the Gonsalves family and seeing the corner. If you like what you see, make sure you smash the notification bell, subscribe and tune in. Love you, Rev Gang. He goes by T Rev, so we'll call him that as well. And he joins us now. This something that we find important. Rep game, strong chest up. Little homie, keep your head up. You can be whatever you want. Get rid of the fake and it will let up. All my life, I strive for greatness. I'm manifesting my time with patience. People try to copy us, but respect is earned. It's not an obligation. I love the fam and they love me back, and that's why I always have the backs. I give a voice to those people who were never given a chance for them slimy cats. When you come here, you ain't a number to me. I really take time to read what I see. Don't forget to lock your doors, cause that's danger all up in these streets. Y'all really put life into the air that I breathe. I really am thankful for all of my peeps. You know